Hi guys, uh, welcome. It's been a while since I've given you a lecture, so hopefully things are going well. Um, just to let you know, I'm using a different program to record. I was recording through PowerPoint and I'm trying uh, the program that Katrina uses, so I think it'll be a little more seamless. I know that there were maybe some issues, some glitches with the last one. Sometimes I like to go back and forth with my slides and revisit points. I think that's where PowerPoint was tripping up, so hopefully this uh, new system eliminates this problem. Today, um, there, for this, this module, I guess we're going to talk about a couple different cardiovascular issues. So um, things like antihypertensive pharmacology, talk a little bit about uh, anticoagulation, and also antiarrhythmia and antiarrhythmic drugs in the next lecture. So we're going to be um, going through a couple different topics. I think most of these have some relevance to uh, what type of work you'll see. I skipped some major topics in, in cardiovascular health, like heart failure, because I don't think it's really going to apply heavily to your, your patient population. Um, but we can talk about some of the uses of the drugs. Most of the drugs we're going to talk about throughout these um, different modules are going to be used in all different types of cardiology. So you'll get some exposure to that if that is something you end up encountering in your practice. So what's the definition of hypertension? Well, really, blood pressure has to be over 140 over 90. Um, some people may go with a stricter goal. We're going to talk about blood pressure goals and current guidelines in a minute and what really we're tar trying to target. Um, but it is the most common disease in America, chronic disease that is, and uh, about 50 million people are thought to have hypertension. Most people develop hypertension at some point in their lifetime. Uh, so usually it's thought of as a disease that eventually you get based on, you know, just being uh, having advanced age, but it can affect people of all different types. And especially um, pregnant women have a chance to uh, be at slightly higher risk just due to the hormonal changes and some of the hemodynamic changes that accompany being pregnant. So it is something you'll likely encounter fairly frequently in your career. Um, but uh, what we're looking at normally is... Uh, uh, decrease in cardiovascular risk by um, treating the hypertension. So that's really the, the end game uh, problem with hypertension, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And you can see there, in, even a slight increases in a systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure equals in fairly large increases in cardiovascular risk. And only about 31% of people with hypertension actually have it under adequate control. All right. Uh, this just shows some of the different areas that can be affected by blood pressure, having high blood pressure over a long period of time. What you want to think about is end organ damage. Think about the small blood vessels sort of at the, at the very, um, <clears throat> we can think of microvascular, um, especially in the eyes, the heart, kidneys. And what you're thinking about is just eventual um, damage done because the pressure is so high on those blood vessels. Blood vessels can take it for a very long time. That's why blood pressure is often called the silent killer. Now, in situations, what we're going to talk about, like eclampsia, that can be very acute and problematic. However, long-term blood pressure is definitely something we want to make sure we're maintaining too because it does take its toll over time. Nice thing is if you catch it early and treat it appropriately, you can um, virtually prevent a lot of these effects from actually occurring. So um, keeping blood pressure in goal has been associated with a 45% decrease in stroke, 25% decrease in myocardial infarction, and a 50% decrease in developing heart failure. So again, catching it early, treating it appropriately is really important. Diagnosis, um, people, anyone over 21, generally should be screened periodically. Every time you go to a doctor's office, even if you're under 21, you're probably going to get your blood pressure checked. So it's a really easy test we can do. Um, the, however, I don't think it's often done appropriately, not necessarily, well, it's done appropriately, but um, uh, the technique might not be appropriate in, in various clinic settings. So um, really to get an accurate blood pressure reading, the patient should be seated for at least five minutes. Um, standing and sitting frequently can cause different changes in hemodynamics and can increase blood pressure, especially if you know your patient just walked across from your clinic waiting room and walked through a maze of offices and finally got in to be seated in an exam room. Um, if you take their blood pressure right away, it might be a little bit elevated. Um, use the appropriate cuff size. That's important too. If they're smaller or larger patient, um, using that right cuff, otherwise you're going to get an inaccurate reading. Taking the blood pressure twice, separating it by at least two minutes uh, is important too. A lot of times I don't think this is done, but um, especially if the patient's blood pressure is elevated, I think it's important not to overreact right away, but to just maybe wait a few minutes, take the blood pressure again. Now, there's always the white coat um, uh phobia that people talk about that, you know, if they see somebody in a white coat or they see a healthcare professional, their blood pressure is going to increase. It is something that's true. Um, if somebody does get really nervous in the clinic setting, you can always have them 
get a home monitoring system or they can go into um, like a lot of pharmacies and grocery stores have these you guys have probably seen them the machines that um, you can sit down at and get your blood pressure checked so anyway average blood pressure on two separate visit is required to accurately diagnose the blood pressure so again don't you don't necessarily have to overreact right away but if it is really high you do want to make sure you're taking the right steps um, to do the appropriate treatment or to get the patient um, the appropriate follow-up needed um, we're going to talk about a couple different things but basically uh, etiology um, essential hypertension is the most common one there's not really an identifiable cause there's a lot of links obesity um, is a strong correlation uh, to hypertension <coughs> increased sodium intake uh, while for most people it's probably not a problem uh, people with healthy functioning kidneys can likely clear excess sodium without much issue but um, over time that excess sodium can cause uh, just people to be slightly fluid uh, overloaded and that can cause increases in blood pressure over time and there's some other things down there that could possibly lead to it as well so non-pharmacologic somebody has hypertension hypertensive we want to address the non-pharmacologic causes too because these can make a pretty big difference in people some people you might not be able to uh, do much with these but it's always worth mentioning so diet um, sodium limitations is important so just keeping sodium normal and this can be challenging for some patients depending on their diet but um, if you need to refer them to a dietitian have them go over high sodium how to read labels and uh, and those types of things so that they understand the importance of fluid retention and its balance with um, hypertension um, healthy body weight if your patient could lose some some could stand to lose some weight that's always worth encouraging again not the easiest solution but it is something worth mentioning um, caffeine intake is one that for some people, may be a contributing factor if they're drinking regular caffeine and frequent amounts of caffeine. Now, the, the average pregnant person hopefully wouldn't be consuming a ton of caffeine, but some people might be, um, and that can definitely have a, a, a role too. So decreasing caffeine intake and uh, and making sure that that's, that's moderate at best, uh, at the highest end. It should be a very moderate amount of caffeine, not a large amount, so that can definitely increase blood pressure. Uh, regular exercise is important. Um, life stressors, uh, so being stressed out can increase your blood pressure. So um, if there's a way for somebody to relax, uh, you know, that's again easier said than done depending on what's going on in their life. Smoking um, hopefully would be a non-issue for the pregnant population or for people trying to get pregnant, but it, it is something that would increase blood pressure. Um, Ethanol intake uh, can increase blood pressure and um, medications such as regular non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, NSAIDs, can uh, increase blood pressure as well. Usually if you take like a, an NSAID would be ibuprofen or, or Advil or Aleve, Naproxen. Um, these drugs uh, work by decreasing the body's uh, natural inflammatory mediators, which helps with pain, but can also decrease some of the pro uh, vasodilatory prostaglandins that circulate within the vascular system and that can uh, prevent some vasodilation systemically which can cause a little bit of increase in blood pressure now if you are taking NSAIDs regularly it could be a problem if you're taking them as needed for a headache once or twice a week probably not a big deal um, this is a, a very vague chart about how we stratify different um, types of blood pressure. So really, I mean, you can kind of look at it from a, a broad uh, overview with this slide and say that you have certain tiers of what's considered to be normal, high, and then when are we looking at sort of an emergent situation? And usually, even if, interestingly enough, people can run really high with their blood pressure, people can be over 200 systolic and still not really be symptomatic at all. Um, it's something we want to treat but it's not something that we necessarily have to have a knee-jerk reaction to. Now, if you have a pregnant patient who's that high, now that, that's probably a different story, but if you're you know, doing your prenatal visits or um, maybe you have a patient who's following with you for primary care, who's trying to conceive or something who's not actually pregnant at the time, um, it's, it's not necessarily something we need to get really worked up about. I'm not saying you shouldn't think about referring them to, but um, managing them with oral medications is usually what's done um, in the emergency department setting anyway. We usually don't manage anyone with IV uh, medications unless there's really a good reason to e either being some sort of other <coughs> um, systemic symptom going on. So maybe they're having kidney problems if they have elevated serum creatinine, that could be a sign of kidney damage. Um, 
If they're having altered mental status, it could be a sign of, of a problem in the cerebral vasculature, which of course is very severe. Uh, there could be chest pain, which could be you know cardiac, and you guys could could go on and on with that. But um, as far as symptoms go, but the point is is that um, sometimes people can run high, but we still manage them with oral therapy, and usually that can be a fairly effective way to manage people. And there are some oral drugs that work very quickly, um, and we'll talk about those here today. All right, so first step, um, before you decide to treat somebody, you gotta look at the guidelines. Hypertension is very guideline driven. And the most recent guidelines was what's called JNC-8 or JNC-2013. These are new-ish. Uh, they were out about a year and a half ago. And they've been, people, uh, before that, the last guidelines I think were 2007. And uh, so it's been quite a few years before we've had really new guidelines. So people have been speculating Excuse me. People have been speculating what they've gonna, what they're going to include, and what they aren't going to include. And so now we have them, and so I'm going to go through them, and also talk about the old guidelines too, and where things are different. Because you may have practitioners who prefer to go with an older guideline, but basically the the new guideline just says anyone less than 60, their systolic over diastolic should be less than 140 over 90. So that's what we've been talking about. That's our standard cutoff. Uh, they did change it for age 60 or over, not really applicable for your guys' uh, patient population. Um, if you do have a patient who's over 18 with um, CKD or diabetes, they do want that 140 over 90 as well. So really not any different there. Um, so um, basically you're looking at a 140 over 90 goal. They, the, the only reason they have that CKD or diabetes, if you had a patient over 60 with that, then you wouldn't, you would want to target the slightly more aggressive goal, the 140 over 90, so in case you're wondering about that. So again, not very relevant to your patient population as far as different goals. Um, the AHA uh, guidelines in 2007 had some slightly different goals. They had a 140 over 90 for everyone except for diabetics, people with kidney disease, known coronary artery disease of so people with history of myocardial infarction, unstable angina, or, or non-coronary vascular disease, so people with history of a stroke, um, peripheral artery disease, um, aortic aneurysm, uh, Framingham, which has kind of fallen out of favor and gotten to the omnibus risk calculator. Uh, if you aren't familiar with that, you can look it up, but um, essentially what it is is it's a calculator and now in the Framingham's an old term I probably should have updated this but it's called the omnibus risk calculator and I can actually change that here omnibus I think that's how you spell it um, but if you have an omnibus risk calculator you should get a link to the American Hearts website and into Google and they'll show you a calculator basically you plug in a bunch of things you tit tell the calculator the person's blood pressure, cholesterol, whether they smoke, their age, and you should get a risk score. Now, if somebody's under 40, you can't actually use it. It's not designed to calculate it for young patients. So um, that's not really relevant probably to most of your patients, but uh, it is a, a tool out there. So if you are above 10%, what this tool is used to predict is your risk of having a stroke um, or CV event within the next 10 years. So if your risk is over 10%, you'd be considered maybe a slightly more aggressive. But again, this is for the AHA 2007. The new guidelines have taken this out of play. Uh, and then they had for people with heart failure an even more aggressive goal, this 120 over 80. Again, that's fallen out of favor with the new guidelines as well. But we still might see people targeting this because uh, they prefer the AHA guidelines because they're a little more specific, excuse me, to different disease states. All right. Okay. Uh, next set of guidelines. I just want to talk about the NICE guidelines, and I'm going to talk about the the new 2030. So this NICE is um, what essentially the, the new guidelines are built up. They're a British guideline, and I really like them because they're very simple. And it actually, the NICE guidelines fit very well into the current uh, JNC 2013 guidelines as well. So you can use them interchangeably. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and with the NICE, you have uh, a nice streamlined algorithm. If you're under age uh, 55, uh, you go with the, the left side of this column. And if you're over 55 or you um, have some sort of African or Caribbean descent, um, you would go with a different strategy. So basically, you're starting everyone either on an ACE inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, depending on their ethnicity and their age. 
And what happens is if that you can't get their blood pressure controlled with those medications alone, you combine the two. So if you started somebody on the calcium channel blocker, you add the ACE. If you start somebody on the ACE, you add the calcium channel blocker. Now we're going to talk about your population for people generally trying to have children. Now, if they're, if they're done having children, they're following with you for primary care. Um, you don't have to worry about it. But ACE inhibitors generally aren't something we're going to use at all in people trying to get pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant. So those would kind of fall out of place with your patient population. We're going to talk about some alternatives here. But if you, again, if you have somebody who's done having children or at least done for the time, ACE inhibitors are extremely effective and they're very, pretty well tolerated medications too. So anyway, and then you combine that. Uh, step three would be adding a diuretic on board. Um, diuretics have are very effective at lowering blood pressure. They've kind of fallen out of favor, mostly because they're not a really convenient medication to take. They make people have to urinate. That's their mechanism of action. So the side effects involving them, um, usually just toler from a toler tolerability standpoint, aren't uh, ideal. And then ultimately, if you tried those three drugs all together um, in step three and you weren't getting effects, you'd go to step four where you could add um, different medications, beta blockers, alpha blockers. And we'll talk about all these drugs today. Now, if you want to compare this to the, um, the JNC 2013 or the 2014 uh, publication here, um, you can see that it's stratified into um, different age groups, different blood pressure goals, and then you have um, black and non-black here, and you can see it's the same. So the non-black population you're looking at, thiazide type diuretic, ACE, ARB, CCB alone or in combination. Um, and then with the black population, you can see they're taking out the ACE or ARB. Now, for some reason, uh, people of African and Caribbean descent don't seem to respond as well initially to ACE inhibitors, not to say they're contraindicated or anything like that. It's just not what we use in a first-line therapy. Um, so if you, if you couldn't get them controlled with that, you would go ahead and add it. And actually, you can see here, if you look at somebody who's a diabetic or a chronic kidney disease patient, and if they have kidney disease, um, you would start uh, an ACE or an ARB regardless of the race. So uh, that would be a case for somebody. Uh, probably not going to be common in your patient population to have people with kidney disease, but it is possible. And this just goes through some other things, how you, how you modify the, med the regimens uh, based on if they're at their goal blood pressure or not and where you add medications. And you'd see it follows the NICE fairly well. Again, I like the NICE guidelines because they're very simple, very clean, explains it very clearly. It's a nice way to look at it. And personally, I would agree with the way the NICE stratifies it versus um, this system that has the uh, choice here. So you can do a thiazide diuretic, you can do an ACE, you can do a CCB. Well, okay, where, what's the best option here? And they're, they're basically saying there isn't one. They're all very good. But I think you can stratify it in a way that makes it make more sense. And that's where the NICE comes into play. I think that the ACE and the CCB do take precedent over the diuretic because of the um, the benefits, uh, the, the lower uh, amount of side effects and, and, and adherence um, issues that come along with diuretic therapy. Okay. And uh, these guidelines are available online if you want to go review more of them other than just the algorithms I've posted, so feel free. Uh, I left this slide in. This is a JNC7 compelling indications. I'm not going to go through very much of it, but it's it's sort of the way we strat we look at treating patients based on certain indications. Now, a lot of these patients these indications um, are not going to apply to some of your patients, but you may account, uh, um, see them come up, especially diabetic patients. Um, I would think would be probably the most common, but there, you might see very various groups of these patients in your practice. And you can see they just have different classes preferred for different um, indications or previous existing comorbidities. Uh, and we'll go through some of this information, but it is here for your reference if you're interested. So starting with the reno, excuse me, renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, what we have here is a sort of a cascade of um, mediators, and this is mostly working in the kidneys. And what we have is a, a, a endogenous mediator called angiotensinogen that gets modified by renin into angiotensin 1, which gets modified by ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme into angiotensin 2. Um, angiotensin 2 itself has some, uh, ish, has some function in the kidney. It also has some peripheral vasoconstriction um, issue properties, excuse me. So if you have a lot of angiotensin II circulating, your body tends to vasoconstrict, you tend to get hypertensive. So it's a, 
um, a transmitter that works throughout the body to cause vasoconstriction. We, that's not something we want in hypertensive patients. So ultimately what angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors do, that be our ACE inhibitors here, they're going to block the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, preventing that mediator from forming. Um, <clears throat> that angiotensin 2 not only works systemically, but it also has a large impact in the kidneys, and it may cause... Uh, over time, you can get kidney damage because it causes some vasoconstriction within the glomerulus. Ultimately, um, we have a process here that uh, by giving somebody an ACE inhibitor, we're inhibiting the production of the angiotensin II, and that's the big focus here. Now, angiotensin II um, works with different angiotensin receptors throughout the body, and we also have drugs called ARBs, or angiotensin receptor blockers, and so they're working here where we have AT1 blockers, and they're going to be blocking the effects of angiotensin 2. So really, you have two different mechanisms, ACE inhibitors preventing the conversion and ARBs preventing the actual um, compound from interacting with its receptors in the body. And we're going to talk about some of the differences with these, but basically the classes of ACE inhibitor and ARB are interchangeable. Um, you don't give them together. There have been a lot of studies looking at whether you get added benefit, because you'd think you might if you're preventing the conversion and the blocking, then you're really hitting it on both sides, um, and they haven't really shown any benefit to giving a combination therapy. So really, it's either or. We're talking about where you'd give them and why in a minute here. Okay, so talked about these. Going to move on here. Um, ACE inhibitors, so uh, these are going to be first line for essentially everything with the exception of your pregnant patients. So you guys might be like, well, not necessarily as relevant to me. And you're right from a certain point of view. But again, if you have somebody who's um, outside of that uh, window of, of getting pregnant, or maybe they aren't going to be thinking about getting pregnant for a while, they're very good drugs. So it's not something to rule out altogether. Um, class side effects, cough is probably the biggest one. People get kind of a dry, non-productive cough with it. It's not a respiratory infection or anything like that. It just happens. It can happen really at any time of taking the medication. Usually it happens early, but it's been documented that it can happen um, years into it. And uh, with the cough, um, if people do develop the cough, they uh, usually just get annoyed by it, so then they switch to an ARB. So that's one of the biggest reasons why people will switch from an ACE inhibitor to a, uh, an ARB. Angioedema is a very severe um, type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, kind of like anaphylaxis. It usually involves a lot of lip, tongue, throat swelling, so people can't breathe. And it is associated with ACE inhibitors. The, the association is pretty low. Um, it, ACE inhibitors get a bit of a bad rap for causing angioedema. I think the biggest thing to consider is that ACE inhibitors are one of the most widely prescribed medications in the country, if not the world. And so we have a huge pool of data to say, well, okay, these patients are taking, so many patients are taking ACE inhibitors that we're going to see a lot more cases of angioedema because it's such a common medication. So even though it's a really rare side effect, when you have 20, 30 million people on one drug or one class of drug, you're going to see these rare side effects come out more commonly. Um, even though ACE inhibitors tend to be renally protective, because I was talking about angiotensin II causing some vasoconstriction within the glomerulus, you can have uh, over time problems with that. So especially if somebody's in acute kidney injury, so somebody's really dehydrated, um, <clears throat> or they've been taking medications that uh, cause uh, additional kidney issues, you can end up with kidney problems. Um, you can get transiently elevated potassium, um, transiently elevated uh, BUN serum creatinine. Um, the beneficial effects come from both uh, suppression of angiotensin II and also decreased bradykinin degradation. Bradykinin, if we go back to our other slide here, um, is another uh, peripheral vasodilator, and um, ACE breaks that down as well. Now, bradykinin is a, does some different things, but that's the majority is responsible for, for the cough that people get. It works in the lungs as sort of a vasodilator, and people usually get the cough because of that. Uh, so that's part of that mechanism there. Uh, overall, anyway, ACE inhibitors, very well tolerated, highly effective medications, almost always first line for most patients. Um, lisinopril is probably the most commonly used one. There's a few others I've listed here. Um, you can remember they all end in pril. They're pretty easy to remember because they're they're very their nomenclature is very straightforward, I think. Um, and there's not a big difference between any of them. Some of them are dosed differently. Some are twice a day. Most are once daily. So it's pretty um, convenient to take them. 
Um, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy, so that's probably the biggest thing for you guys to take away from this uh, as far as what's contraindicated. And again, if somebody has renal failure, acute renal failure, we hold off on them. We can restart them afterwards. And again, switching to a different agent would be the cough that's caused. And I've got a little diagram to show you the, um, the blood flow throughout the glomerulus and um, that it causes constriction in the afferent arterial, which is generally... Um, Sorry, it prevents constriction in the afferent arterial, which is generally good in kidney protective, but can be problematic in acute kidney failure. Oh, excuse me, wrong slide. ARB is generally interchangeable. The cough is extremely rare. It doesn't affect bradykinin at all. Um, same effects, uh, precautions as ACE inhibitors with respect to angioedema, though. Um, there's approximately a, be a 10% cross-reactivity for people who react strongly to the ACE uh, with the ARB class. So generally, we don't give them. Um, it's thought to be a contraindication. Um, again, we don't combine them with an ACE inhibitor. Um, the names all end in Sartan, which is here. So you have Losartan, Valsartan, et cetera. Um, Losartan and Valsartan are the only two that are generic. The rest are all brand names. So you really don't see the other ones used very frequently, um, but they are available. Um, there's some thought that Losartan, even though it's been generic for the longest, it's probably the least potent ARB. So you might get better results with some of the other ones, newer ones, but most people are going to be on Losartan or Valsartan. There's one drug called a direct renin inhibitor, and I can spend a lot of time on it because it's very rarely used, called aliscarin. And the only real way people are going to use this is if you have that significant hypersensitivity reaction to um, an ACE inhibitor. So if you've got that angioedema, um, they, they'd probably put you on this because uh, while it's not clinically been proven to be as effective as an ARB or an ACE, it has been shown to be fairly <clears throat> um it's thought to be comparable just because of its mechanism, but um, clinically it's just not used very often. It's, it's expensive. It's very uncommon to see it, but um, it is an option there for those people with um, substantial allergies. The aldosterone antagonists, not used for hypertension, so I'm going to kind of gloss over them quickly. What they're really referred to is potassium sparing diuretics. They play a fairly substantial role in heart failure treatment. Um, but beyond that, that's all I really want to talk about with them. They're listed here for your reference in case you want to look at them. Um, but again, these will almost never be useful in, uh, for hypertension. All right, moving on to the diuretic class. Um, the glomerulus has a couple different parts to it where our, our diuretics work. So we have the two major classes, I guess three, if we want to look at uh, loop diuretics here working in the loop of Henle. They um, work with the potassium sodium chloride symport. Then you have thiazides, which are kind of potassium chloride symport. Potassium sparing diuretics, which are found sodium potassium hydrogen exchange uh, transporter. And you can see why these are called potassium sparing diuretics, uh, because they help uh, resorb, they help prevent, excuse me, prevent, prevent uh, potassium from getting excreted. Um, where um, we have uh, other ones that, um, like the loop diuretics for blocking this, we're going to get excretion of sodium, wasting of sodium and potassium that way. Same thing with thiazides, we're getting wasting of sodium, not really as much potassium. So thiazides are really our, the only one we're, we're concerned about with hypertension treatment. Very relevant drug today. Um, they inhibit sodium resorption, basically, and so water follows sodium, and um, you get increased water excretion. Along with that, you get some increased potassium and hydrogen ion excretion. So you will see some electrolyte disturbances potentially with thiazides. We don't think of them as causing really profound hypokalemia, but it is possible and we do monitor for it. Um, where we do see a, a more problematic side effect is sodium. So if you do have people who are borderline low sodium, you can end up seeing that uh, exacerbate substantially with a thiazide diuretic. So be careful with that. Um, thiazides are one of the oldest classes of hypertension uh, medications. There was a trial that came out called All Hat, which is kind of a major trial, and it looked at whether low dose thiazide was as, as successful as drugs like amlodipine and lisinopril, which at the time were a little bit newer. They were thought to be more beneficial for patients treating hypertension, and it was shown that even low dose thiazide was still just as good as amlodipine and lisinopril. Um, now they're all generic, they're all cheap, so it doesn't really matter. We can kind of pick and choose. But at the time, it was a big deal because they're proving that you know thiazides can still treat blood pressure fairly effectively. 
Hydrochlorothiazide, or HCTZ, um, is the most commonly used medication in this class. Um, the doses are, are listed there. I'm not going to ever test you or ask a question about doses, but it's there mostly because um, my, the point of this is to keep a low dose with a thiazide. You don't need to give somebody 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams of a thiazide diuretic. It makes no sense. Most most of the time you see um, benefit doses up to 50, uh, 75, or excuse me, 25 milligrams. Uh, once you get up to 50, you don't really get as much benefit between 25 and 50. Over 50, you see virtually no benefit. Um, there's another drug called chlorthalidone, which um, comes as IV and suspension as well, but it's, it's also an oral medication, and it's two, one and a half to two times as potent as HCTZ. It's also longer acting, so it does cause more powerful diuresis over a longer period of time, but um, it has the side effect of wasting a lot more sodium, so people can get hyponatremic. I've seen a couple of people come in to our emergency department fairly hyponatremic after starting chlorthalidone. Finally, there's metolazone, which is just really used in as needed for heart failure patients who have extra fluid built up. It's a very potent thiazide. It's not used for blood pressure management, though. Loop diuretics, I'm going to pretty much gloss over these. These would be something you might see in a patient who is having fluid accumulation. Um, in your average practice, you probably aren't going to see this a lot or use these a lot. Now, there could be uh, an occasion where, where this is necessary. Most of the time, it's due to patients who have a heart failure or renal insufficiency. So if you work with patients who may have those underlying um, problems, could be something to consider. But loop diuretics are really potent. They're very fast. They, they work fairly quickly, and they, they're off fairly quickly. So what happens is they, they probably have a uh, six-hour or so duration. They cause a very potent diuresis during that six hours. So they get rid of a lot of fluid during that short time period, and then they, they're gone. So the nice thing about it is if somebody can take it and know that they're going to probably have to urinate fairly frequently for the next few hours, but at least they aren't going to be going through the night and doing it. So they can kind of time it a little bit that way. But again, these are going to be for a specific patient population, probably not ones you're going to see oh, excuse me, uh, very frequently. Um, Non-aldosterone, potassium sparing agents. The only reason I listed these is oftentimes they're combined with different drugs. We see them combined with hydrochlorothiazide a lot for prevention of potassium wasting. They aren't used as model therapy. All right, moving on to calcium channel blockers. There's two major categories here, dihydropyridine and non-dihydropyridine. Um, dihydropyridines uh, are important because they really just act Peripherally, they're potent vasodilators, and they don't have really any effect on the heart. Um, they're great for blood pressure management, and they always end in the word or the the the, suff, the suffix uh, dipine, d-i-p-i-n-e. There's the non-dihydropyridines, which are less potent vasodilators, but they work very um, much so on cardiac con contractility and conduction. We're going to talk about those a little bit with antiarrhythmics. Uh, mechanism, um, <clears throat> you have uh, the sinoatrial node, which calcium channel blockers will slow if they're working centrally in the heart um, by blocking the calcium channels on the, myo on the, um, the myocardium cells itself. Uh, also, you have uh, calcium channels on um, cells that work uh, within the uh, ar arteries, which can dilate as well if you block those cells. So I think of calcium sort of as a general contraction. Um, Ion, where if you have uh, calcium influxing into a cell, you're going to cause some sort of a contractile response in the muscle cell, and that works in the heart and also in the vasculature. So if you're blocking those calcium channels, you can keep things a little bit more vasodilated over time. Here are dihydropyridines. Again, these are going to be the ones used primarily for blood pressure control. Um, amlodipine is by far the most common. It's been around a while. It's generic. Um, however, there's several other ones, and in fact, the one you're probably going to be more familiar with as midwives is uh, nifedipine. Nifedipine or procardia in the middle there um, seems to be the one that's really preferred for people who um, are pregnant. Uh, nicardipine is just thought to have more data associated with um, use in pregnancy or more anecdotal use in pregnancy. Not to say some of the other medications couldn't be used, they just aren't really well studied, as with most things in pregnancy and lactation. Dihydropyridines, um, side effects are pretty well tolerated. Headache, dizziness, flushing, maybe some peripheral edema are seen, but most of the time they're, they're probably 
some of the better tolerated uh, antihypertensive medications we have, which makes them a great first line option for patients. Um, if you're uh, heart failure, I'm going to gloss over this. Um, heart failure patients usually don't need a lot of antihypertensive effects, and these don't have a big role in heart failure. They're mostly purely antihypertensive medications. They don't really have much mortality benefits in other cardiovascular disease. Um, and I guess I did have on this other slide, most are pregnancy category C, which doesn't mean a whole lot, but uh, means that they haven't really been studied all that much. But again, um, uh, nifedipine is used very frequently in pregnant patients, and it seems to be a preferred option. Nonahydropyridines, these are really medications that, again, work in the mostly centrally, so with on the heart itself, and they're going to help with rate control. So these are going to be mostly for people who are tachycardic, don't really have great hypertensive benefits, antihypertensive benefits. Verapamil um, might have a little bit more peripheral activity than diltiazem. Diltiazem is really a pre um, cardiac medication. Verapamil might have some, some benefit elsewhere too. Um, we usually use diltiazem. However, I believe verapamil actually has better uh, long-term well, not long term, but better historical data uh, with pregnant patients. So if you have a pregnant patient who's tachycardic, they may prefer verapamil. However, I think diltiazem is also an acceptable option from what I've read and what I've seen. Non dihydropyridine side effects, uh, hypotension, bradycardia, probably the two biggest ones. Um, and there's some other things here that I don't think are great uh, to talk about. But again, these medications aren't going to have a huge effect on blood pressure. They're just really going to be working on the heart, with the exception of rapamil, probably having a little bit more of an uh, antihypertensive effect. All right, beta blockers. Beta blockers usually end in OLOL or LOL, so they're pretty easy to remember uh, it, once you see them. Like propranolol is the example I gave here. Um, side effects uh, can be all over the place. Um, you can think about the basic side effects are going to be bradycardia and hypotension, but um, people generally don't feel great when they start taking beta blockers. You can get even depression, fatigue. Um, people just feel tired and it's because they, their heart rate isn't functioning as quickly as it used to and their body's going to take some time to get used to the medication. So beta blockers, unfortunately, from a side effect profile, probably are the worst class of drugs we have um, for hypertension management. The good news is as people's, as your body gets used to the beta blocker, should um, alleviate some of those side effects over time. Uh, not guarantee, but it is something that can happen. Um, I put mask diabetic symptoms on there too. If you have like a type one diabetic patient or even a type two, but um, any person who's at risk for hypoglycemia, one of the side effects of hypoglycemia is tachycardia. So if somebody has, um, is used to knowing how their body responds to hypoglycemic episodes by feeling their heart racing, they aren't going to feel that on a beta blocker. So you need to, they need to be aware of that and know that they have to look for other things. Sweating is another one that happens during hypoglycemia, so that can be a good one to counsel people on. They know what to look for. Um, bronchospasm is something that can be caused by beta blockers too. Beta blockers, um, we're talking about selectivity, we'll talk about the different agents in a second. But there's beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 receptors are primarily located in the heart, beta-2 primarily in the lung. Most beta blockers we use in, in clinical practice work on beta-1s are selective for that because we don't really want to block beta receptors in the lungs because it can cause bronchospasm. If you block beta receptors in the lungs as well, you can diminish the effectiveness of um, rescue inhalers for asthmatic patients, so like albuterol inhalers, and uh, that can be very problematic in the episode of an asthma exacerbation, as you might imagine, because you're blocking those receptors and most of our uh, and our major drugs that work on those receptors are beta agonists within the uh, lungs. So we're going to talk about that mechanism and those medications during the respiratory, so I don't want to get too far into it, but just so you guys know. Um, there's a bunch of different beta blockers uh, that are listed on this slide, and I highlighted a few different ones. Um, I probably should have highlighted labetalol too for you guys since it's going to be the one you see most often. This is a modified lecture for my PA students, so put a highlight there too because those are important. Um, these are probably the these four ones, uh, the three I had highlighted at first, probably the most commonly seen ones, and then labetalol is going to be the one you guys see a lot. Labetalol, 
Uh, and it's an older medication. It's not selective, not very selective. It's beta 1 and 2. Um, it's got a pretty fast onset when taken orally. So you can get good results pretty quickly with it, even by giving a pill. It also comes IV. And it's got a lot of data with pregnancy, and it's very well well studied and well known with pregnancy. So that's why we use it. Um, is it to say you can't use other medications on this list in pregnancy? Well, you maybe could, but we just don't because we generally labetalol works pretty well. Uh, the biggest problem I would say is that it's not selective. You can see the selectivity there. It's beta one and two. Um, it also has some alpha blocking uh, potent um, properties too, which can help with um, fighting against peripheral vasoconstriction um, by agonizing alpha receptors in the periphery. You via like a sympathetic nervous system response, you can get vasoconstriction. So if labetalol is not only blocking the betas and the alphas, you can have uh, a benefit there by blocking that alpha process too, which is also going to be leading to vasoconstriction. So labetalol is a very effective drug you can use very commonly in pregnancy. Okay. Um, okay, so that's our major classes. Now we're going to talk a little bit about managing it. Really, the concept here is mixing and matching classes. This is showing a little bit about where your different drugs are working. Um, again, this is the NICE guidelines, which I like. Uh, and they fall into place and they match up with, uh, with what the JNC 2013 recommendations are. They're just more streamlined, so I think it's an easier way to look at it. General strategy, mix and match your classes. Um, you want to maximize dose before switching. So monotherapy is usually the best way to approach things. Um, about 30 to 50% of patients will only need one drug to control it. Um, that's not great, but it is a fair amount of patients. And remember to maximize your dose, and that's the dose is tolerated. So uh, if the patient's having side effects, for example, if you're trying to start them on labetalol and they get bradycardic, well, that might be a reason not to, of course, push the dose higher on that. But you may be getting some benefit from a low dose of labetalol, so maybe you keep the labetalol on and add on nifedipine or add on hydralazine, which we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, but most of the time, start with one drug, maximize your dose as best as possible, and then move on from there. Um, if somebody's blood pressure is really high right off the bat, you could consider starting two agents. Uh, ultimately, I don't see this done in practice a lot. I think a lot of people will start somebody on one and then work them up with, with that and see how they respond to that. Um, but if they are really high above their goal, you could consider two agents right off the bat. Um, compelling indications, again, not going to apply to a lot of your patients, but you will see some of this, I'm sure. So remember to look at what is a compelling indication and how to work, uh, or how to work that into your treatment recommendations. Um, uh, my pro tips for you are if they have cardiac history, a beta blocker is almost always indicated, and if they have um, renal risk or renal complications, an ACE inhibitor is almost always indicated, and that includes diabetes. Really, you can't go wrong with an ACE inhibitor. Um, with the exception of somebody who doesn't really have any comorbidities and they are um, of African American descent or are African or Caribbean descent, uh, you would consider a calcium channel blocker right off the bat. Now, again, of course, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy. So for your patient population that you're seeing most of the time, probably not something you're going to consider, but it is an option, again, for people who aren't. And here's just a reminder of these compelling indications. Um, other therapies we have uh, that I want to go through. So what if your patient is on multiple drugs or can't take certain drugs or whatever? Again, I recommend maximizing your doses first and then adding on therapy. Um, alpha blockers, I'm not going to talk about much. They probably are never going to be used in your patient population. Mostly we use alpha blockers in men who um, have maybe some benign prostatic hyperplasia going on at the same time uh, because it can help with um, the, the urinary flow through the prostate gland but ultimately um, they do have some blood pressure effects too. So it could be used in women very rarely, um, but it would be, again, very unusual to see that done. Some other options too, which could be more relevant, clonidine, which isn't really gonna be useful in pregnant patients, but could be used in other situations. What clonidine is really nice at is decreasing blood pressure fairly quickly, even when you give it orally. Um, it's got the fastest onset of any oral medication we have. 
Um, the other nice thing about clonidine, it's got a totally different mechanism from all of our other medications. It's centrally acting alpha-2 agonist, which if you know your alphas and betas, you know that alpha agonism peripherally causes vasoconstriction. Now, centrally acting, it actually causes a vasomotor outflow the, um, from the central nervous system to the periphery, which causes the reverse of that. So you end up with a peripheral vasodilation process going, um, and also some bradyc and also some decreased effects on the heart activity too. Um, so uh, with uh, with clonidine, it works quickly. Um, probably not going to be used commonly with your patient population. Hydralazine, on the other hand, is used very commonly in pregnancy. What it is, it's just really a direct arterial vasodilator. It comes IV and PO. It's very fast acting. Um, it's three times to four times daily orally, so it's a really inconvenient medication to take, but um, that that's what it is. And side effects, mostly people get, um, people can get chest pain with it. People can get flushing, palpitations, um, some other types of things that are rare that I listed there, but mostly I think flushing and, and um, chest pain probably be the most common ones with hydralazine. All right, so pregnancy. Let's get to let's get to the meat and potatoes of what you guys want to know here. Um, gestational diabetes, um, blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. So our goal really is the same for pregnant or non-pregnant patients. Um, <clears throat> then you move up into your so preeclampsia is some sort of hypertension plus protein in the urine. Um, this is usually initiated by the presence of trophoblasts. And eclampsia would be tonic-clonic seizures with associated hypertension. It's rare, so it's usually 0.5 to 2% of preeclamptic women can go on. But if you have a preeclamptic woman who is uh, really hypertensive, you want to treat it very seriously because tonic-clonic seizures are not only bad for the patient, but can be um, put the pregnancy at high risk for termination as well. Chronic... Um, Patients who are chronically hypertensive, so prior to their pregnancy they were hypertensive, um, <clears throat> you want to see them um, managed appropriately. Um, chronic patients can develop into preeclampsic patients, so you do want to treat them just like you would anyone else. But um, you want to make sure you're looking at their therapies and making sure things are appropriate. So if a patient comes into you and she's diabetic and has chronic hypertension, she's probably going to be on an ACE inhibitor. So you want to make sure you can convert them appropriately to some other therapy. And these are really the ones we're looking at here. Um, I list methyl dopa, even though I don't see it used a lot anymore. Methyl dopa is essentially clonidine, but just a, a more mild version of it. So um, it's a central acting alpha agonist, just like clonidine. It's got pretty mild effects in a slow onset. It's also kind of sedating too. Um, people don't tolerate methyl dopa great, but methyl dopa is historically very well tolerated in pregnancy. It has some of the best pregnancy data that we know for any antihypertensive medication. So methyl dopa is an option, but I think it's kind of fallen out of favor to some of these other drugs, which is uh, specifically labetalol, nifedipine, and hydralazine. Um, beta blockers, we talked about labetalol a bunch already. That's a good drug to do. Calcium channel blockers, again, generally speaking, not well studied. However, nifedipine does seem to have the most evidence for use in pregnant populations. It is used extremely commonly in pregnant populations. Um, does it have as much data as methyl dopa and labetalol and hydralazine? No, it doesn't, but it is used very commonly. And then we have hydralazine. So these four drugs listed in bold on this slide are really the ones you probably are going to be sticking to for pregnant patients. So if somebody comes to you um, because they got pregnant and they're on an ACE inhibitor, uh, you need to know what to be able to switch them to and what are the safe options to switch them to. Or if somebody develops hypertension during pregnancy, you have to be aware of what you can start. And uh, these are really good options to go to right away. And remember, different they have different benefits. Labetalol is going to decrease the heart rate. So if you have different benefits and side effects, I should say. So labetalol will decrease the heart rate. If you have a patient who is borderline bradycardic already, that might not be a great option. If you have a patient who likes to exercise a lot, likes to run, but is a little bit hypertensive, um, labetalol is probably not a good option because it's going to cause exercise intolerance, decrease their heart's ability to increase during exercise. Maybe hydralazine is a better option. Maybe nifedipine is a better option to start with. So think about those issues uh, or those specific patient um, circumstances that may tailor your therapy. And there really isn't one right way to start therapy on a, on a hypertensive patient um, in pregnancy because there could be any number of presentations to it. So really take it into consideration 
uh, and make sure you're approaching it from the, the best way that's going to um, work with the patient. Um, you can always try something and stop it. The nice thing about hypertension therapy is it should work fairly quickly. Sometimes you might see like a week to get a full response, but for the most part, you will have a, a relatively quick turnaround between starting a medication and seeing the results. Um, with that being said, um, you aren't with the patient. The patient's not coming into your clinic every day. So what you need to do is have your patient be monitoring their own blood pressure at home. So setting them up with a home monitoring cuff or um, having them go if they have, maybe they live right next door to someplace that has a machine, like a pharmacy. So going into there uh, every day, but it's really easy to get those home monitoring cuffs. Not a lot of insurances pay for them. So I'd recommend doing that and having them check at home regularly, keep a diary so that they know what their blood pressure is doing. So you can track the changes. Um, and adjust therapy appropriately that way. Um, this just talks about preeclampsia. I'm going to go into this in a, in a little bit here, and this is some of the, the um, what up-to-date lists as um, the presence uh, of different um, symptoms relating to preeclampsia with severe features. Uh, so preeclampsia, um, you can, let's we'll start with prevention first. So somebody who uh, maybe has been preeclamptic before uh, with previous pregnancies, or um, you think maybe it's just really at high risk for preeclampsia. Um, aspirin once daily, starting the uh, second or end of first trimester, uh, has been shown to possibly decrease risk. And it's thought that preeclampsia is associated with increased platelet turnover, interestingly enough. Um, beyond that, the mechanism is a little fuzzy. But the benefits to giving aspirin, aspirin is uh, an antiplatelet drug, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. But the benefits are mild. Um, you would want to discontinue it five to 10 days prior to delivery to decrease risk of bleeding, uh, but it is something that's an option. Aspirin is generally thought not to be okay to use in pregnancy, but at, it's thought that for preeclampsia prevention at really low doses, it is acceptable. I don't think it's done very much in clinical practice, but it is an option. Um, if somebody is preeclamptic, uh, you want to deliver the baby if appropriate. So if you're within the, the appropriate time frame, maybe going into delivery to prevent, um, you know, going into a, a more eclamptic situation where you're getting a seizure. Uh, methyl dopa, labetalol, hydralazine, and nifedipine are all perfectly good options. So all the things you'd give somebody who's pregnant for chronic hypertension um, work well for um, for uh, uh, preeclampsia. Labetalol, hydralazine uh, are both available IV, nifedipine is oral only. So usually in the acute phase, you're going to see labetalol given fairly fre frequently and hydralazine potentially. And then once somebody transitions down, they might start a nifedipine PO uh, medication. Uh, avoid your ACE inhibitors and ARBs uh, and you should be fine. Um, for severely preeclampsic patients, um, high-dose magnesium sulfate IV um, is given. So we give a lot of magnesium over a very short period of time. And magnesium um, has some muscle relax smooth muscle relaxant properties. It also has some vasodilation properties. And when you give a lot of it at once, um, it actually has been shown clinically to be more effective um, than benzodiazepines as anticonvulsants. And we haven't talked about benzodiazepines. But when it comes to treating seizures in the acute phase, benzos are the gold standard. Um, so it's interesting that patients who have preeclampsia, we give magnesium to, and it's actually been shown to be more effective. Now, you could probably give benzos to a pregnant patient, too, who's actively seizing. But the idea is that magnesium is going to work to prevent the seizure from occurring altogether. So these are going to be highly preeclampsic patients, very high risk. want to get them, prevent them from going into an eclamptic seizure. Uh, mechanism, again, cerebral vasodilation is really key. Blood-brain barrier protection um, is going to be what's causing the anticonvulsant properties uh, with magnesium IV. And if you've ever worked as a nurse um, doing magnesium replacement in a hospital um, and you've never seen this done before with the high-dose magnesium IV, it is a lot of magnesium. I mean, you're looking at a few grams an hour, um, probably between two and four grams per hour, depending on how fast they want it to go. So you see uh, a fair amount of magnesium infused over a short period of time. Fortunate thing is a lot of magnesium doesn't usually cause too many side effects. Even if you get high magnesium levels, it's a lot but you're a lot better off than having an eclamptic seizure. So um, the risk, uh, the benefit definitely outweighs the risk with uh, it, um, with aggressive magnesium therapy. Uh, for postpartum patients who are lactating, 
Um, there isn't a ton of data. This is basically what I was able to gather from some of the different uh, references I looked at. But beta blockers, uh, there's the best ones are the ones that basically when you're looking at lactation, you want stuff that doesn't get into the breast milk. Um, and so when we're looking at beta blockers. The ones that are best are probably going to be the ones that excrete into the breast milk least. So propranolol, metoprolol, and labetalol all seem to have good use. So that's nice. If you have somebody who's taking labetalol during their pregnancy and we're well controlled on it, continue it throughout the through lactation as well, assuming they need it. Atenolol um, seems to excrete more into breast milk than other uh, beta blockers. So that's one to watch out for. There's some question mark ones too that we just don't really know all that much about. Calcium channel blockers, best are listed there. Um, nifedipine, uh, again, going to be a preferred drug. So you can, you can keep somebody on their nifedipine if they're on it during pregnancy. Um, now, at this point, can you start an ACE inhibitor? Yeah, you can, actually. Captopril and enalapril seem to have the best associations uh, with um, excretion into the breast milk. Um, however, they could cause complications related to hypotension, kidney injuries. So you got to make sure your patient's kidneys are, are doing just fine after their pregnancy um, and make sure that they aren't already hypotensive or, you know, um, they, these drugs tend to be a bit more potent um, than like a labetalol with respect to blood pressure lowering. So depending on what dose they're on, they might have a better, they might have a more uh, intense response to uh, uh, ACE inhibitor um, if you start that postpartum. Diuretics we generally avoid because they re can reduce breast milk volume, not because they're bad drugs, but if you're lactating, you, you want to make sure your production's acceptable, so we want to make sure that that's not being interfered with. And diuretics are one that can potentially do that, so we generally avoid those. Um, and really, that's it. That's the end of my lecture. So if you guys have any questions about hypertension, let me know. Hopefully, this format worked a little bit better and didn't cut off on me at all. Um, but again, uh, thanks for the feedback so far, and uh, we'll do a couple other, we'll do one other cardiology lecture and then an anemia lecture for this module. Thanks, guys.